Mika Dubrovsky is an artist, but she also believes everyone is an artist. Originally from Russia, where after an education in visual arts, she was involved with the cultural underground of the 80s, she immigrated to the United States in 1989, right after the communist regime fell. Interestingly, once in the U.S., Nika seemed to take up the same position she had under totalitarianism in circles of cultural critics and activists. Perhaps because she believes everyone is an artist, most of Nika's work revolves around projects which might be categorized as social rather than artistic. For example, one of Nika's most recent projects is the Museum of Care, the concept of which comes from an essay of the same name which Nika wrote with her late husband, David Graeber, during the pandemic of 2020. The essay imagines a world in which the office buildings left empty by lockdowns are turned into communal spaces, or museums of care, after the pandemic, the way royal palaces were turned into state museums after the French and Russian revolutions. That idea might sound a bit left field if you've never heard of the work of Nika's husband, David Graeber. It was actually through David Graeber's work that I learned about Nika Dubrovsky in the first place. David Graeber was an anthropologist and true public intellectual. You may have heard of some of his more popular books like Debt, The First 5,000 Years or Bullshit Jobs. The latter book proposes that a lot of jobs today administrative, managerial, marketing, legal, financial, and consultancy jobs are, in fact, not actually necessary. Hence, bullshit jobs. And hence the radical idea of turning vacant office spaces into places of culture. The idea of art and the place of art and the artist are important to Nika Dubrovsky's and, for that matter, David Graeber's cultural critique, which is why I wanted to interview Nika for this podcast. If the term radical comes to mind when you listen to this conversation, you're not wrong. It's okay to question the idea that everyone is an artist, and it's okay to wince at the term art communism and the idea of revolution. I don't always agree myself, but I do hope that you listen. I usually edit my conversations down to half an hour, but precisely because I do not have a lot of time these days, I've decided to just do some light editing and otherwise leave the conversation pretty much intact. I've added some timestamps so you can better navigate through it. Nika and I talk about the underground art scene in Soviet Russia, the Proletkult movement, which believes everyone is an artist, the idea of direct versus indirect action, the creation of autonomous zones like the Zapatista communities or Rojava. And at the end, I ask Nika three questions about her article, co-written with David Graeber, Another Art World which critiques art institutions as they exist today, among other things. When I was very young, I, had, I was very lucky. My parents were poor students, so they rent the room in our two-bedroom, one-bedroom, two-room apartment to another student who was a um, musician. And so she was... Um, kind of living with me in the same room and end up being my friend, although I was like five years old or four and she was like 25. And so she was uh, introducing me to all this magic uh, stuff, like listening to the silence or getting letters from the piano notes and things like that. So that's, I think, was... Like I would go to the kindergarten where life was ordinary and boring. Sometimes we have, you know cruel uh, teachers and so on. And then I would come home to this magic place with all kind of surprises. So I just wanted to stick to that part of my yeah. life. Yeah, so the first encounter was this it was music, actually, uh, and not uh, visual art. Um, and then you got cut probably to at least a decade later, you got um, involved in Samizdat, which is really interesting to me because I'm half Czech and we had our own important tradition of Samizdat and this underground art. So I'm just fascinated by that uh, part of your life. Yeah, then uh, then actually I went to the uh, art school when I was 12 and I had like an amazing teacher. Uh, like that was like a bad experience overall because they train us to, to draw, you know, as a real artist um, in the Soviet times. 
uh, official culture. And then uh, when I was 16, I met the guy named Adim Maximov, who I consider my teacher still. He was a theater guy. And my first real art experience immersed art experience was in the theater where he was running this uh, student theater and we, was, we were putting together plays with um, Michel de Gilderot and Symbolist and yeah, so that was my time and, and this um, theater also published uh, Summer's Dad uh, magazine that was kind of theoretical so and yeah, that's uh, that's I was illustrated it and writing for that. And it was really amazing. Yeah, but it was I mean, from what I know, it it was actually quite dangerous to be involved in some is that no? I mean, you there were real consequences. Yeah, but you know, I was like really already in a very soft time. So yeah, right. Soviet, uh, 80s. it was eighty five, eighty six. Um that kind of was very soft dictatorship. No, not dictatorship. Stagnation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what they call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you have all these incredibly fascinating projects that just have everything to do with the place of the artist and the pace, place of the human being. Um, and I just don't even know where to start. I would probably start with the Museum of Care, maybe, um, which is. Uh, well, you tell me. I mean, I I listened, I read, and I listened, uh, but it's really a free space of of uh, of exchange. Really, the museum of care. Um, it's a, this idea of a place that belongs to everyone, right? Yeah, yeah. It's an idea of the place that belongs to everyone, exactly. So I was like, since I um, I'm not a career artist, I. Uh, I never found my place in the existing structures. Uh, and so the, the idea also that existing structures are really <laughs> not so good <laughs> and they're suppressive and we want, we want actually to, to change them. And so David and I, uh, during COVID times, we wrote a couple of texts about uh, Museum of Care, what it, what it could be, and we just loved the name, <laughs> Museum of Care. Um, and yeah, and then when he died, uh, this was, uh, and I felt like really lonely. Um, that was very natural things to to do. And it's actually, I, now I think about that, uh, all this technology, uh, with Zoom and Jutsu and so on, is really helpful. So now it's so cheap to collect quite a big crowds uh, throughout the world and exchange uh, whatever you able or want to exchange. But the whole idea of uh, Museum of Care was just like this outskirt spaces uh, that built horizontally. And it's coming back to the also Soviet ideas of prolet cult that was run by Alexander Bogdanov uh, in the beginning of 20th century, uh, just after Russian Revolution. He was very quickly removed uh, from his place, but still... Uh, Whatever structures they built, they were so uh, strong ideologically that up until uh, my time, which was uh, in Soviet Union, they were still present in certain forms. And I mean, this is something that I think is important to underline, that uh, there was this tension within uh, the the communist society between something like the prolet cult, which wanted really personal freedom and was was ex exper experimenting with avant garde art and this kind of thing, and then the state, which really suppressed it as much as possible. Which I I, I just think it's something that people in in the West. Uh, I wonder if you also encounter this that people in the West who have never lived under communism don't understand. Uh, this yeah, exactly. Tension. This is yeah. really yeah. This is a really good point. It's. It's so obvious uh, for me, for example, but it's abs most of the people don't get it because it's a propaganda in a way. You know, it's all that, okay, whatever was in Soviet Union was communism. And of course it wasn't. It was a monopolistic capitalism. And so, for example, if we talk about Prolikul specifically, uh, Bogdanov was very quickly removed. Uh, and uh, the, all of this amazing infrastructure that was built from bottom up was centralized and rebuilt from up down. So Soviet Union um, has 
declare all of these wonderful values of equality and horizontality and, you know, so on and so forth. But in reality, it was like one big corporation yeah. uh, run by quite dumb people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's actually this is it's it's maybe we should back up a little bit because eventually you went away, you you left Russia. And then eventually after probably I, I imagine and I don't exactly know the timeline, you met uh, David Graeber. And of course, D David Graeber was talking about these same issues that you now were talking about with the state and, and social structure, debt, all of this fascinating stuff that he saw in totally different ways. He has just this way of looking at everything from a, a different perspective than than everyone it seems and yeah. um just uh, tell me about this this conversation yeah that you had with him yeah so i left russia 30 years ago in 1989 and then uh, i met david 15 years ago um in new york when i lived in new york and yes so david like in his first we were like really very strangely because we, we, we came from the um from the countries or from the world that was uh, in war, in the Cold War, uh, for many years. Um, he, so he, he grew up in New York and I grew up in Leningrad. <laughs> so we were like in the centers of the, of the enemies. But we had so much in common uh, because, for example, it's in his first book um, that was his dissertation uh, called The Lost People of Madagascar. He's touching that he's like the book that he's taken with him two books, Bakhtin and Dostoevsky. Um, and uh, yeah, so and my teacher, as you already mentioned, um, Vadim Maximov, when Perestroika, like it wasn't really Perestroika started, but it was kind of feelings that, you know, things are going to change. And uh, many people were very excited, especially excited that the West will come in and change everything for good because people of course got Soviet people at that time um, didn't like the, the oppressive government, Soviet government and uh, my teacher was always saying like you know government is always government state is always state <laughs> you know? and, and that was like really uh, really important so yeah this, this tradition uh, uh, that was in Soviet Union was still also in the U.S. and uh, David's father was actually fighting in uh, civil war in Spain uh, on the Republic side, and and his mom grew up in uh, in Stettel in the um, Soviet Empire. She was uh, she she came to New York when she was ten years old. And she, uh, her first language was uh, Yiddish. So my my grandfather too. So we were like really really similar yeah. people. Well, it's it's fascinating because you were looking at the, from different sides at at the same coin. Because uh, David Graeber made uh, a lot of his career of criticizing capitalism, and here you came from this totalitarian regime, and then actually yeah, he the, was he the, was yeah he was criticizing state state capitalism yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was like uh, equally correct for both sides for yeah. both countries. Yeah, yeah. So then there's also the visual assembly and the idea of the. Art is not as genius, but as facilitator. Yeah. So Visual Assembly is a project, again, that David and I supposed to do in October 11, 2020 in Graz. Um, so we were invited to do Visual Assembly, like how to rearrange hospitals or the places of care. And he died in September. Uh, so uh, we didn't do it together, this one. And we... Um, Instead of that, it was an international carnival for David, instead of funeral. Uh, but the idea of visual assembly is um, kind of developing or building up on the same narrative, how, uh, how artists can be useful in order to help people to uh, come together and to uh, decide, in this case, plan social spaces uh, collectively. Yeah, so the I don't know if you read this essay that we wrote with David uh, uh, Art in other art world, mm -hmm. was published in Iflux, oh. and there the idea of um, what is an artist and how all it's formed uh, developed in more details. Well, can you can you delve into that a little bit because this idea of the artist as unnecessary it's something that we had to 
faced during the pandemic a lot, uh, didn't we? Um, and what is your as, as unnecessary as music? unnecessary art is unnecessary don't you think well at, at least in the in the performing arts this was uh, uh, oh no i wouldn't say i think i think uh, during covid time and pandemic uh, it feels quite opposite it feels art is very necessary uh, <laughs> i mean at least in the czech republic for example and i think something similar happened in the us you would actually there were points of time when the theaters were closed but the sports stadiums were open right mm-hmm. so I mean, there is there is a kind of attitude towards art as something superfluous. Yeah, yeah, no? because I think in our society, art is a plain role of entertainment and um, also uh, tagging the social class. Uh-huh. Uh, that's the major kind of function of art. But uh, it could have a different role. Um, and that's whole, yeah, mm-hmm. it should have a different role more than that. Yes. Like, for example, in... in Prolet cult Alexander Bogdanov. It's many uh, great event in the history where, where art uh, described as like a important part of the society. Like in Prolet cult, it was supposed to create this new proletarian art. In in proletarian understand was understood not as the industrial work only, but much wider Mm -hmm. so yeah so prolet cult was uh, trying to basically prolet cult was about communism not about soviet state building soviet state but building this future uh where everyone uh have rights and framework a possibility for uh, creative expression uh so what happens is i think during two years, the members of the prolet cult in the Soviet Union was, uh, I think, many times, like, I don't know, 10 times bigger membership than the membership of the Bolshevik party. <laughs> so, they were pro- like, in some provincial towns in Russia, suddenly it was like a dozen of theaters open where, like, people will come together and put plays and, you know, sing songs and so on. Um and then, and that's that's the moment when they were all uh, centralized. And then we we also have uh, Joseph Boyce in during the in the other side of the of the coin uh, in in the Western world, who is also quite directly talking about social sculpture and um, direct democracy and how how the role of the artist and everybody is an artist. That's very important. Ah. Is to build. A beautiful and um, democratic social structures. And why everybody is an artist? Because if you don't give somebody or some group of people access to building the social structures, they're, they're not collective and they're not beautiful. So it's it's a um, it's a kind of obligatory to to involve um, everyone who want to be involved. So in this case, uh, communism is not the um, this kind of mythical place where you know uh, industrial workers or <laughs> like people who's working on the uh, on the conveyor production suddenly seize the power and organize everything for everybody else. It's actually a, a place where everyone is have r- the rights and means for creative expression, or everybody is an artist. And all the place is a museum of care <laughs> in a way, you know. I guess what I'm hearing is that uh, a healthy society is one where everyone can be an artist. Yeah, uh, if they want to. If they want to, right, can be, yeah. But it, an artist in this case understood very widely. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So when we're talking, uh, we are right now, you and I, we are creating something together like a collective content that we can call an art. We're putting our efforts in order to formulate some reality that uh, then we want to share with some other people. So it's that everyone is a creative creator, creator or creative. Yeah. So we are not. We are not. So in another way, we are. Uh, we have to like try to move away from the mode of production and consumption and move towards the relationship, social relationship where we'll be creating and co-creating together. Right. And so we're so much. Uh, trained by our system that this, it's not possible, technically not possible, or that, uh, you know, this is not good, or like, you know, 
so many arguments that uh, there is no other way, but I believe they're all ideological. And actually, it's like plenty of other way to, to live. Well, I think this is, I was going to ask you about a quote. I think this must be the meaning of a quote uh, that is one of the, the main quotes on David Graeber's page, which is the war against the imagination is one the capitalists have actually managed to win. Is that what he's talking about? The war against yeah. the idea that this yeah. could be possible. Yeah. And also technically possible. So that's why, uh, so I just created a David Graeber Institute and we only have two projects. One is uh, we're going to welcome David Sarnhaif and try to publish stuff. And another is uh, called Brain Trust. It's a project that David started in the last year of his life about climate change. But as always around David, everything was positive. So he would never, you know, <laughs> he was a very cheerful person. He's like, okay, we have a problem. Let's solve it. <laughs> uh, so this Brain Trust uh, will be very practical um, projects. Will be, uh, uh, all together, maybe more, but at least 12 lectures, and each of them um, will be connected with something that we can actually do uh, in order to to live uh, in a situation when, one, climate change already happening, and two, government is not going to help us. So it's a kind of taking a leap from Extinction Rebellion and all of these protest-oriented uh, ideas and it will be about, uh, you know, we're not going to petition the government. We're going to try to do something, um, something what we can do ourselves. And one of the first lectures, uh, I hope, will be done by Alan Bauer, who is, um, who is a creator of, um, I think, 80% of 3D printers that is now out, um, an open 3D printer called RepRap. It's a 3D printer that's printing itself. And I think it's it's really important idea. It's actually exists for many years. For Like it's all around the world. When I met uh, Alan Bauer, it, I think it's cost thousands of euros to to acquire one of these rep wraps. And now it's cost less than 200. So each year it's getting more cheaper and cheaper. And so when we're told that, you know, we have to participate in this production consumption um, circle, it's basically, you know, otherwise you can't dress, you can't eat, <laughs> mm-hmm. you can't survive, yeah? But no, actually we can now. We have the technology. Uh, we just don't want to use it this way because technology is a social thing. And, um, and you know, we, 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 we can have one dress, we can have one million dresses. It's never, it's never enough. Uh, Unless we have like a social arrangement in which we can say, okay, this is what how we want to live. This is what we need for living this way, and then and then just proceed. And that's art is very important in uh, in this um, in order to achieve that because art is about storytelling, mm-hmm. and we humans uh, choose the stories we want to pursue. You mean that through storytelling is how you can uh, expand uh, the imagination, for example, about how uh, society can be structured? Or make, yes, and also make your conscious choices. Yeah. You can say, okay, I don't want to live like that. I do want to live like this, and I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. So it's also like David used this term, creative refusal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that he has an article, creative refusal, r- written uh, I think it, it's uh, 2003 or something like that, where he's explaining the, um, his ideas. Uh, this is an anthropological uh, research. It's not uh, an ideological standing. Like he thinks the society is like that. No, he's saying, okay, this is how societies like have been acting toward each other. Creative refusal. Does that have something to do with schismogenesis? This idea that people, that societies, adjacent societies, also define themselves against each other. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's the so, same mechanism. Yeah, but it's also uh, a description of human being as somebody who can consciously make political choices, right. who is not, uh, you know, like mechanically moved by some. Yeah, a cog in a choices. machine. <laughs>
who is not a cog in a machine. It's funny that this belief in technology that, because a lot of times when people think about uh, this idea of refusing, the, let's say, society and the mechanisms of society and going to live your own life, there's often this kind of rustic quality to it, like you have to give up all this technology. And it's interesting, what's different here is that you're saying, actually, no, you don't have to give up the technology. Exactly. That's a very principal moment because what happens, you know, all of this kind of revolutionary movements uh away from the current order, they uh, took the shape of basically rich people going and living in their, you know, resorts, <laughs> whoever have land or like spare island, you know, they move there, they grow their potatoes, they kind of pretend to be, uh, you know, revolutionary and living off greed, but, you know, most of the people cannot afford to do that. Plus, there is not enough, uh, like, places on off for all these billions of people who's living now to to move away from the cities. So this brain trust project is about urban poor. So this is like how can we live where we are uh, right now? <laughs> it's like we're not gonna kill people. Can we actually live where we are with what we have? And uh, without this current system that is killing everyone including the rich people who is running that. Uh, it feels like something that even as, you know, these ideas of freedom and liberation and, and anti-capitalism are circulating, but there are these versions that work very well within the system, you know. <laughs> um, they don't, they often integrate really well within within the cat. They get sold very well. Yeah, this is like about anthropology, how to change uh, um, common imagination, you know, why the suddenly... Uh, this society decided to do this and <laughs> this society kind of uh, moving uh, different ways. Yeah. And and also you can see that people are trying different stuff. Like I uh, uh, saw how it's developed with Extinction Rebellion in uh, UK closely and David and I was kind of... Uh, so the Brain Trust was actually formed by David on the ask of Extinction Rebellion, who wanted a positive program, because at that time, in 2019, they believed that if they will create all these mass mo movements with civil disobedience, then the government will um, will change, and then they will be, you know, forced to, to, uh, to change their directions. And so they did create this mass movement, because Extinction Rebellion is one of the biggest mass movements in the world now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government, in the UK at least, and also in some other European cities, they just become harsher to the protests. So now they are arresting people. It was much softer in the beginning because they didn't understand, the government didn't understand what they're dealing with. Uh, but when it's become like really huge with like uh, occupying bridges in London and so many people voluntarily volunteering going to prison, then uh, they just constitute this like, quite harsh laws. Yeah. When they can arrest people with no warrant, or I don't know, all kind of like really things that was not possible uh, before the Extinction Rebellion. So I just believe, uh, like, we, every, everyone understands now that it's going to be harsh with climate change. So people just try and different things. I, I often don't trust actually what. Uh what is actually happening and then what what is actually presented as as being as being as having a lot of uh, momentum you know what i mean mm. because i think that at this point it's clear to everyone that whatever is being talked about online is going to be uh the thing that has the most kind of fuel you know to go um and i just because i for one have have not heard a lot about the extinction rebellion in recent times mm, interesting and i wonder if that doesn't have to do with maybe it doesn't have to do with the num the sheer number of people or the momentum or anything but just yeah they they started now because extinction rebellion is decentralized movements as many as all movements now is decentralized so they they started a new branches so for example in the uk now is just stop oil uh but and uh, I think they like a lot in the news, but I, I believe their whole strategy is just concentrated, very, very concentrated demand. For example, just stop oil. And then lots of people throwing their bodies, a lot of young people just throwing their bodies, going to prison, you know, glue themselves to, I don't know, whatever. And, uh, and in order to drag public attention, but mostly uh, they try and petition in the government. And that's a very old technique. Yeah. 
that has a big part in the UK and Western history. And uh, yeah, so David was um, famously commenting on that, that it's a difference between uh, petitioning the government and direct action. And the difference is if you're petitioning the government, you're making a demonstration in the village where you want to have a well to drink water. So direct action, you don't petition in the government, you go and you dig a well, yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's, uh, that's the difference. So so how is Ex Extinction Rebellion digging the well as opposed to petitioning? No, they're not. They're petitioning the government. Oh, yeah, they yeah, yeah. They're petitioning. Okay. They're saying just stop oil, uh, start the citizens' assembly. Basically, they're saying government, uh, we are strong. We are like, you know, lots of people listen to us, do what we want. And government is telling them, no, we are stronger. We put all the people in, in jail, you know. Yeah. And that's how this conversation is developing between them. Well, it's, that's the futility, I think, right? Because it's con this constant conversation and it just feels like it's an uphill battle, like there's just the, the, the government is always stronger. So how do you then dig the well, <laughs> metaphorically? Yeah, very interesting. And that's, I think, uh, uh, also coming back to what does it mean to be an artist? So government is understand power language. Uh, Extension Rebellion was formed by the guy who was a sociologist who calculated how many, he wrote a PhD about how many percentage of the population should be engaged in the civil unrest in order to government to affect the government. And uh, he believed in these numbers and he uh, acted and convinced other people to act it according to these numbers. So in this case, uh, he was this vanguard male in the way <laughs> that led in the crowd. Uh, uh, and part of the Extension Rebellion was an art group that I'm most close was in, in David. And so now like the Graeber Institute is have like some people from this art group working. So the idea is not to uh, directly engage your government in their power language, but to invent your own language. That's what artists do in actually. Uh, yeah. So artists is uh, and they like I, I believe everybody is an artist who is able or willing to participate in this creative uh, uh, innovation of uh, the way how we communicate with each other. So instead of like forcing the government to and talking to the government in the power language, I think we humans or citizens should try to to create our own horizontal connections um, and try to create our own uh, way of living or autonomous zones. And there's plenty of that things going on everywhere. You know, it's like this. Um, our friends from ZAD, this autonomous zone in, in France, who is constantly doing tons of stuff. Uh, there is the Church of Stop Shopping or the Earth Church in New York, and so so on and so forth. Like it's it's millions of initiative, uh, and so we I think we every everybody should just like surely not slowly quickly <laughs> try to to expand their like their own autonomous zone. And then see, maybe, yeah, maybe government, government is also uh, contained, uh, is cons constituted from the human beings. They're not aliens yet. Yes. <laughs> uh, at least I don't believe that they're aliens. So, and, yeah, we, we basically should create another, or uh, another civilization in a way, and everybody will hopefully join. Well, the, the the thing that's so fascinating about this uh, this latest book that that uh, David Graeber wrote with uh, David Wengro is that it shows just the vast diversity and how human beings have chosen to to survive and the beliefs that they have and that really what defines us is is real is. Uh, an ability, a, a diversity in how we are able to live, not any one way of living, right? Which, to me, what what what's kind of scary about that is that we might be living, but maybe not. Maybe you'll disagree. We might be living in a time when there is much more of a monoculture all over the world, um, instead of uh, this these really these autonomous uh, groups that are really able to flourish uh, in their own uh, specific uh, way. Um, yeah, like uh, the the last uh, David's book, Pirate Enlightenment, th that just come out is um, is exactly marking. Uh, the, the existence of these marginal zones on the ages of expanding empire that uh, actually now expand everywhere in the world. We don't have any more, you know, uh, this kind of new world don't exist. Everything is 
got covered by uh, capitalism. Uh, in China, everywhere is, is the same. Uh, but still, this is not true. We have like thousands of different ways of living inside of uh, of this huge, vast empire. Like, look, Zapatistas, for 30 years exist, Rojava, and, you know, like indigenous groups all over the world. They keep fighting. This is not something that's over. And uh, hopefully, you know, like we are going to win because if we are not going to win, now it's clear you know, the other side will just fuck the herb so badly that nobody will survive. So basically, they have to join us as quickly as possible. They have to run and join us. But I mean, do, do you think that there is that that shift is happening? Are we in a different? I mean, what's your idea of progress, for example? <laughs> it just depends how you use the the term. Yeah. Now, if you talk about like the progress in the in the like as as a salvation, you know, like oh, this coming one day where everybody would be good. No, I don't believe in that. <laughs> and the progress exactly is, is used this way. So I grew up in Soviet Union where the vulgar Marxism was taught, but it's not so much different from the you know Fukuyama. So also, like in the uh, Soviet Union, we were told, like, yes, like soon it will be this moment when, like, you know, total communism, there is everybody would be happy, there is no money, you know, blah, blah. Uh, and then Fukuyama also, you know, it was, oh, the end of the history, like now everywhere is a democracy. And it's like, come on, guy, you know, people are starving, <laughs> like it's a wars everywhere. It's like, so. Yeah, I don't believe in that. I think human nature is complicated. Yeah, it's it's also very well described in several, uh, in many places in David's writings. I'm uh, hopefully going to publish his lectures soon, and they're like really very clear. His to the students talking as as he, as he, he can, only he can do that. Like very tra- uh, with a very simple, understandable words, talking about this idea of um, Hobbes and Rousseau. Uh, that we are still living in this universe, believing in this laws and in this uh, agreement, but so, uh, social um, contract and so on as a, as a something that will so, save us and bring justice and bring equality and so on. But you, we have like examples of communities who is living outside of state, like Rojava, for example, very successfully. And not only doing that, you know, it's like the only place um, in the Middle East uh, to my knowledge, where uh, Muslim and Christians and Jewish and Armenians and everybody is living together. They also have like lots of um, ISIS fighters that they host as uh, uh, in the camps. <laughs> That's just bumped on them, you know. So, and they still kind of uh, live together very well. Uh, and they have to also protect themselves from Turkey, who is attacking them constantly. So we can live like that um, if, um, and they don't have state. It's not a 30 hippies. It's actually like a, a big territory uh, for, for, yeah, and for a, almost for 10 years. So it's, it's, not, it's not like fantasy. It's a reality. And I think that's why they are talked, because they actually show in, in practice how it may look like. I mean, it's interesting. Again, I don't know, you know, if this is the case, but I... Uh, despite my interest in these subjects, I've never heard uh, of of this. I've never really heard of communities, uh, true uh, kind of communities living off of outside uh, like this. And and so I, I think that it's convenient just if you want something not to exist, just to ignore it and not, not allow the conversation about it. Yeah, you know? or destroy it. Or destroy, but in today's information media, it's almost sometimes enough just not to talk about some, or not not to give it a, a platform. Let's exactly say, uh, online. Yeah. yeah, David was always trying to write about Rojava. He was in Rojava, I think, two or three times, and uh, it was very difficult to publish. He was like really push when I mean, he was famous. He was really pushing these articles and conspiring and intriguing how to how to publish about them anything. Was- and what places, for example, or what were the reasons uh, that it wasn't that they gave not to publish it? Oh yeah, that's interesting. That is also in the Chomsky book, Manufacturing Con- Con- Consents, is it how it's work. Yeah, it wasn't like you know we don't want to publish about Rojo. It was like oh we need to check more like you know information about that. Wait a minute, and that's minutes would be like five months, and then somehow 
disappearing, you know, and then you go to another outlet. It's like, please publish, like, or like, you know, somebody was asking him to publish anything. And he would say, oh, great, I want to publish about Trozheva. And it was like, <laughs> we we're not sure about that. <laughs> like, yeah, so that's how it goes, very politely. In the, in the Putin Russia, they will just put you in prison if you, like, you know, <laughs> want to do something, but, uh, but the state doesn't want, and uh, the West is much uh, softer and smarter. That's, and that's, yeah, that's so interesting. It all, all you have to do to sometimes, uh, you don't even have to murder, you just can ignore. That seems to be the strategy. Yeah. Also, you, you said something very interesting about um, art or the value of art uh, in a conversation about the Museum of Care. And I think you used, if I understood correctly, you used the, the uh, example of the Mona Lisa and that the real value isn't in, is in the relationship that's formed between the, the, it's the viewers and the painting. It's not the artifact itself. Can you, can you talk about that? And then also expand a little bit just uh, the value of art and how the art actually works to maybe change, either change minds or perhaps involve people? Because I think sometimes it's very difficult for people to understand art as something else than this exclusive thing that's on a pedestal and that's somehow judged. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, today uh, we will have a reading group in the Museum of K about uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, art, uh, art uh, in the times of mechanical reproduction. He wrote it in the 1920s, but that's about, uh, yeah, about the aura or fetishization of art. So when we believe that, you know, certain piece of, um, you know, such an object like Mona Lisa by itself contains some, you know, values that uh, transcendent. This is, um, this is, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's a fetishism. <laughs> it's, it's not a reality. So why, why Mona Lisa is so important for us? Because it has all this cultural connotation, all this context. Like, you know, I saw it first time, when I was five years old in the magazine that my mom brought, and then I went to the museum, and then here, and then there, and then I read that, and then I read this. And so overall, all of this uh, uh, social tissue that created around the object. At this point, Nika and I ran out of time and agreed to meet again later. This gave me the opportunity to carefully read the three-part essay, Another Art World, which Nika wrote with David Graeber in 2018, and which was published in November of 2020. So this is our conversation about a week later, in which I posed three questions about the essay. Uh, I, did, I spent a lot of time you know, reading all three sections, and I just wanted to see if I could summarize it very briefly to you and see if you, you think that that's a good summary. So this is my... Yeah, amazing. And then please send me the soundtrack so I can have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the summary then of another art world. The art world is a structure based on exclusion and it leans on romantic principles of the genius and then also this commercial um, principle of the myth of uh, scarcity. It has to create the sense that art is something scarce so that it can have a value um, on the market. And then you make a really big point about uh, the police. So the, the way I would summarize the, the police versus the art institution is that the art world exists to maintain cultural hierarchy the same way that the police exists to maintain class hierarchy. Would you say that's a, a fair summary? Okay. And then the, the solution to that, that's the statement of the problem. And then the solution, I would the summary of that solution is art communism, which you said was already tried in the beginning of the 20th century as the proletkult. Um, the idea of which that everyone, well, everyone is an artist, but maybe more accurately, everyone should have access to the means of producing art. And then the the sentence I would kind of take out of that, uh, to, of, of the essay to kind of summarize what art communism might be, um, art communism would be a world no longer divided into geniuses and dull, obedient fools, uh, spectators, either uncomprehending or adulatory. Everyone would become both at the same time. Basically, I, that that would be. There are so many other things you could pick out, but I would say that in the bare bones, that's the essay, right? Mm -hmm. There, I basically I have three questions for you uh, about this, uh, and the first one was as I was reading it, especially when you say everyone would become both at the same time. I think, well, in a way, we have a big social experiment happening right now with the internet, or ha that has been happening for the past couple decades, because the internet did kind of theoretically 
provide a platform for almost anyone to create content, right? Anyone can, has the means to share work. Um, and yet this hasn't really created the kind of, the kind of uh, equal <laughs> egalitarian world that you would think, because you still have incredible like winners and losers in the system. Um, and this isn't just because something like YouTube or, or a place like, like Twitter doesn't actually pay people, even though these people that create content online, in fact, are creating the very thing which these platforms then use to sell advertising, right? And to keep people engaged. So you can say that, but at the same time, there's a lot of small creators who have, um, who now have access to a way to crowdfund, but even in crowdfunding, which you would say is a great way for kind of communities to build around something. It, there is a huge amount of people who just cannot figure out how to support themselves through crowdfunding. And it, there is also this incredible eventual kind of um, weightedness towards a few people who are able to do it. You'd think that the internet was kind of a social experiment and everyone having the means, but then it never, it never really materialized that way. I was wondering if you ever had any conversations or, or thoughts about that. Yeah, I think it's a question, what does it mean to have a means? Because the means is not only the means of production uh, that is necessary to produce, let's say, art. It's also the idea, what is art and what is artist? Uh, like, like a collective idea. So uh, internet was uh, developed basically by the government, not under capitalism. It was developed inside of the structures. The people get salary. They don't need to compete with each other. That's why not only internet, also uh, the major software that's now used by Apple, also in Linux, it's always developed by the government uh, institutions or educational universities. But then the overall internet uh, started to be exploited uh, by capitalism that created, again, the same things that was in the... Um, the beginning of the essay, yeah, scarcity, competition, uh, the idea that you know not everybody's <laughs> equal actually, and so uh, so the whole system is arranged around uh, creating this this balance because that's how this machine are working. So yeah, it, and, and yes, and it's interesting that uh, Boris Gross was uh, famously saying that now. Um, uh, everybody is an artist that uh, in in a way that you know everybody have their uh, their own facebook page or you know their uh, twitter and they like have running like a little gallery where they present themselves the identity or the museum sometimes it's not a little yeah it's, it's it could be a big one uh, but that's uh, yeah that doesn't uh, make everyone geniuses uh because you, you do need this, and generally the people who is uh, entangled in this apparatus of power or has like this support of uh, power support, then they are like becoming this kind of stars. And and even the, uh, like and also Chomsky in Manufacturing Content explain why the, the people who seems to be very much um, outsiders who become, who gain power also... Uh, actually playing according to the rules. And I would say about David, that David uh, was very conscious about the rules and he was trying to play them instead of rules played him. And, and he was very successful in that. So he was, for example, trying to publish with the big publishers with means of productions, but he also would um, uh, protect his own kind of soul and content production as well from, uh, from the agenda of the... Uh, of the machine, uh, like he, when he was, uh, when he wrote bullshit jobs, so in that I think he was uh, invited to the endless talks uh, to to talk about the same things, and he was like, "No, I'm not a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> like, stop taking me interview about the bullshit job. I already uh, wrote everything, so just just read it and write your own." So he was he was really about um, like uh, protective to his own freedom as well as yeah. Uh, to to freedom of other people. So what uh, what uh, when, when we were talking we talked about prolet cult and that's uh, like the fourth chapter. I don't know if I will be able to write it without David, but uh, um, I'm trying to finish that. Is and it's uh, more details and it's also have other examples from 
not only prolet cult, it's just like the, the one that I know more. That's why I talked about this. And David then, uh, was talking about uh, the UK. I, I think in the second essay, uh, he was talking about how um, unemployment benefits in the UK created a whole generations of the artists and uh, musicians that actually allow English culture to conquer the world. That's from all these bands came from uh, welfare state when the people don't need to work. So uh, prolet cult, it's not only creating means of production for the masses, like artistic or cultural production, it's create a different type of infrastructure where the the, the people were, in the beginning of prolet cult, where the people were able to uh, to produce content horizontally and exchange um, without um, without a kind of division in a way on the high and the low culture. That's exactly what happens in the late Soviet Union when the prolet cult was was uh, centralized. Like uh, um, you know, Krupska and all of these government people started to send orders to the low level uh, participants, provincial artists, and tell them, okay, now you have to talk about I don't know. Uh, fight of the working class against bourgeoisie. So don't talk like that. Talk like this. So they all become uh, unpaid uh, employee of the this ideological machine, and that's why I think in uh, in the uh, internet it's actually a really good um, comparison. I think I should yeah maybe I will use it uh, in this also in this text if you're okay with that uh, because. Yeah, because uh, it's it's uh, it's showing how technology is by itself uh, is not or means of production is not actually mm, mean a lot. It's a question how you use it, and for what purpose, and how we collectively um, decide what is valuable or what is not. And that's why David always was saying that the revolution is not when you uh, conquer Louvre or Hermitage. Uh, <laughs> The revolution is, uh, uh, like he was quoting Wallerstein, revolution is a change in a common political sense. So that's what we need to do. So in this in this case, art is like really important because art is in in a it's a place where this kind of uh, value is created, but it shouldn't be created for or by uh, a couple of people or like layers of population. It either either everybody share that. Or you don't have this revolution. So I just want to quickly about the internet. You said that the internet was created by the state. The way that I understood it was actually that the roots of the internet are quite anarchist, but they were not, the internet was not able to really survive within capitalism without kind of halfway going towards it. And the problem is that it's, it's very, it's very, actually the internet is very widely accessed, but then in order for people to make money off of it, um, they've kind of, you know, they started selling data instead of selling access to social media. They started selling people's data. Uh, but I mean, like created by the government because, uh, no, so it's a, it's a historical fact that Internet was invented by the science. Part of them were working for the military industrial complex in the U.S., as well as in Russia, it was, uh, like in the other blocks. It's also some type of uh, Internet uh, or cybernetics ideas developed in computers. No, the 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 origin of the internet is in the government, and in this case, it's only mean that these people didn't want to make money. They didn't have the question what to sell data or access. They didn't want to sell anything. They were actually trying to create an efficient way of communication in case if it will be a war. You know, and then they have to be decentralized. That's why it's designed the way as as it designed. But then, yes, true, there many people got access to that, and it's so many great um, during uh, during the beginning of the internet. But many of them, like like for example, if we talk about Wikipedia, how amazing was the idea and the guy who started it wasn't particularly ideologically very kind of progressive or kind, but. It's it's uh, it's 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 an amazing uh, place, even if it's commercialized and uh, uh, centralized. Now there's a lot of problems, but still, it's one of the kind of exactly as a it's it's so much as um, an idea of this prolet cult, you know, when anybody can come, change. Everybody is an editor and writer uh, at the same time, and it's also very interesting about Wikipedia. Um, 
very much in line with this uh, our text about another art world. Um, Jamie Wallace, the guy who ran Wikipedia, he's actually making lots of money. There was a big scandal about him because he's controlling, he's an editor of the celebrity part. So he is the guy who is actually can get bribes uh, and allow some people to uh, change the articles and some people not, you know, and if you're like a famous actor or, you know, whatever, uh, CEO, we need your article to be okay. Let's show where the power is lie in our society. <laughs> I think that the critique of, I mean, the, the most kind of cogent critiques of the internet I've heard as it, as it exists now are the ones that critique that it tries to be both things. It's trying to be both open source and um, sust- uh, kind of sustain uh, people uh, and, and their, their material uh, desires and needs in, in a capitalist kind of uh, context. Yeah, I agree with that, but I will add that this is like a little bit dangerous for us to see people always uh, find a, a way basically to make something good, something bad, because actually it's not always, it's just there is a system, everybody like in our society have to have money you know, uh, like it's many societies this specific way make the money many societies who have a different uh, framework uh, or many groups in our big society who have a different framework and who use internet also differently in this case. So I don't think it's something um, guarantee. I think inside of the internet there is a lot of big actually also projects that um, trying to uh, trying to reorganize the system. And uh, it's, it's never fixed. For example, I'm really amazed uh, and I'm looking forward to take part more actively uh, in this uh, initiative called Mastodon, that is a distributed social network. Yeah. Um, we are like a little bit late, but we are by David Graeber Institute is buying the server also to provide people with access to so to host it. Because when I tried to, to move from uh, Twitter to Mastodon, I, for a while I wasn't able to find a free server. So I end up in Italian, small anarchist server in uh, Bologna, although I don't speak Ital- Italian. So yeah, so we are going to 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 pay for our hosting. So it's also will be one of the places where the people can uh, can host their own um, social media accounts. So that's a very big initiative. It's many many people. Uh, there is no money involved, so it's involved as a donation. And I would just say, actually, capitalism in, in this way is it's miserably not working. Like I started my blogging experience from. Uh, the place called Live Journal. I don't know. Probably it's a small platform now. It was in uh, in the beginning of 2000. It was that time? It was big. It was run by the school school high school student. You know, <laughs> somewhere in the in the US with his family. It was run by seven people. It was millions of users mm. in 2000s. Uh, people were given donation. I think donation was uh, twenty dollar a year. Just, a, just appreciation, uh, not forced by anybody, but if you can pay, you pay, I paid. Uh, so the family of the student was getting $1 million a year uh, for the from the nation. So lots of money, very effective business, I would say, yeah? And he promised everybody that he would not sell it, he would not put ads, he will just keep it for community because everybody helped him to develop that. Like, you know, and then, of course... Late, a little bit later, this particular guy, Fitzpatrick, uh, Brad Fitzpatrick, the student, sold it to the company Six Apart. Immediately, this company hired a lot of, like, you know, accountants, CEO, lawyers, blah, blah. This business become unprofitable and they will need to introduce advertisement then. Abuse team, censorship, da 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 and then very quickly they sold it to the Russian oligarch <laughs> because there was a lot of Russians there. So Russian oligarch started to use it for political uh, propaganda. He started to ban the accounts of activists. Like just before the election, he will close everything for maintenance. So in this, the, the story of this one project, you see how it's very quickly developed from you know, uh, community-based, profitable, good. Everybody was happy, <laughs> but one person just basically stole everything um, because he had a legal right. And then, and then he just 
uh, kill it all. And but the, in the process of killing, we can see how power is transferring and how power is very quickly turned from content creation that was an original through money making to basically uh, political oppression. You know, and this is all very connected. But this is a perfect example. So how do you stop that process? Oh, you can't stop that process uh, at, uh, completely everywhere because we are living in a capitalism that is a bigger structure than us. But uh, in the same time with this, uh, when Love Journal died, it was a bunch of other people who organized at least six projects. Um uh, in Russia, at least, it was. I, I, and and, the, and uh, now, actually, Mastodon is also some kind of Russian guy in Germany is, is, uh, wrote the code. So I think what, what happens, uh, it's, there is always two ways of living exist in the same system. And it, it's just our, in a way, task is just to support the other one, you know. Right. And that's, that's as simple as that. Well, simple to say, but complicated to do. <laughs> um, well, my second my my uh, second question was actually about this idea. I think you you made at one point a distinction between art um, and entertainment. Um, but what that made me think about was uh, because at, at some point in the essay, um, another art world, you do talk about the nurses during COVID. And and about the survey that was done, talking uh, uh, where where artists were, I think before last or even even last on the list of most essential professions, and it got me thinking about these these nurses, especially in these incredibly stressful times, when they come home after after all that, when they have their necessary point of rest. Generally speaking, they're going to go to something that is produced by artists, be it you know music books, uh, uh, you know, even if it's a Netflix series, a lot of times they're going to go to what you would call uh, entertainment because they're very often going to go to like Netflix just to get their mind off of, uh, the, you know, what what they're the difficulty of what they're dealing with. But people need something like that in their in their life to 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 give meaning, I think. And so I wonder if on the one hand, yes, everyone should have, you know, should have this uh, access to the means of, of, of producing art, but then also art as a service to others, because making and, and consuming art are two different things. Yeah, I, I think it's an artificial uh, separation between uh, consumption and production. And, uh, you know, it was not always like that. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a part, again, of the same system that's imposed on us. Think about this. When we talk about entertainment, we're talking about, as you said, about something that people enjoy, <laughs> you know, that they don't need to work for. Yeah. So now we're living in the world when um, some smart people with college education, they're watching Gadar and, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe Bertolucci or whatever, like uh, Fellini and uh, this stupid people watching the Hollywood crap. Yeah. Uh, uh, that is very ideological. Yeah, by the it way. is. <laughs> the same things was yeah. The same things was in Soviet Union. Like you know, if you if you belong to the cultural elite, you will read some kind of some is that magazine. So you know, some kind of like special books that is difficult to get. And then if you're mass, you go in and watch the social release production. But actually, like looking far away from uh, in some epoch, many of this mass production was really good you know, really perfect. And uh, a lot of this uh, elite production is crap. And I think the same today. And, and for me, ideal art is carnival. Like th that's the model where like, you know, the, the, um, the barrier between production and consumption crossed when the people are, you know, in the same time part of uh, a body of art, but they also, uh, you know, kind of consuming that. Because it's a, it's a point in which social order reorganized. But even if you think about, like, I started to go to musicals now. I, I never have been, like, first time in my life I went to Broadway <laughs> musical a couple of weeks ago when I went to New York. And this was amazing. You know, it was really cool because, like, I felt like I'm in a subway. It was, like, thousands of people. And uh, it was such a strong... Um, effects was produced on uh, on uh, you know kind of throwing on us as an audience and uh, and it was a lot of foreigners like new york like i think most of the tourists are going to broadway then i went to another one in london that was 
like Hamilton, that was really also ideologically very liberal and I, I didn't like the musical but again I like the genre so I'm trying to find somebody who will produce a musical for uh, about bullshit jobs you know <laughs> because I think it will be hilarious it will mm-hmm. be like you know this all this like masses that is uh, suppressed you know who's supposed to be happy but actually not it's, it's like a new working class uh, opera or yeah and, and uh, I, somebody sent me somebody from some friend, uh, Twitter fa- friend, uh, sent me the link to the Hong Kong opera of the 60s. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is so urgent, so sharp, so cool. It was like all these males in their suits was like dancing, desperately saying that uh, they uh, make to work long hours in this unhuman environment when they have to like, you know, uh, kind of push each other out and uh, it's all for having a normal life, a wife and a kid and a house. And maybe they don't want a wife and a kid and a house at the end as an exchange for that uh, work. But so I, I just want to uh, to say that uh, maybe um, with all the restrictions, commercial comics, uh, commercial musical is kind of trying to reach out to that uh, feelings of carnival where, you know, because to be popular, they have to grab on our feelings that we have in our normal life. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they have to, 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 to incorporate us. They, they need us as, um, as participants and every, every good art want want to have people as, uh, as a part of the world they create and, so I, I don't think it's a real separation between um, in a, in a, between kind of you know stupid people who who do, who's just like you know so tired after the nursing job that they only can sit like that and like you know look at the screen. I wasn't actually saying that in a negative way. I was saying it that it can actually that 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 is a necessary thing. Sometimes you need to to find that congruence again in, in a story, for example. Can, can give that to you because stories are a way of organizing the world in a way that makes sense because our lives actually often don't make sense <laughs> and we need some sense making. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that is the service that an artist provides. Now, what you're saying is that actually a carnival means that everyone can provide uh, the service exactly the same way. But when you talk about musicals, the work and years of training that are behind that for people to be able to to do those co- coordinated dances, for there to be an orchestra, for there to be the kind of lights, the kind of everything. I mean, I know because I've also studied performing arts and these are these institutions that train us also are the kinds of institutions that exactly that you're critiquing. But I, I do wonder if to have a coherent, you know, to write a coherent story, it actually takes a lot of training and it and it takes someone who uh, has, has had the time. You're totally right. Yeah, you're totally correct. And I, I don't think in Carnival everybody providing the same type of skills. I think it's uh, people who do costumes, people who sing, people who do different stuff. It's just um, the whole field arranged in ideal carnival, yeah, not in commercial carnival, but in ideal carnival, arranged in a way that um, everybody have their place in this collectively creating social tissue. You know, in the commercial art, this border is much more uh, strict. But there is also like many features like Bertolt Brecht and so on, where you know uh, people are much more engaged. So it's always versions, but definitely. Uh, some people are training to be that or this, and that's uh, that's great. Yeah, no, it's just that it, it's it it makes me wonder because I think a lot of artists will take issue with this because they're like, well, I have trained years and years and years, and I've been yelled at by conductors, and I've taken all this, you know, <laughs> this uh, this this shit for it, and I've still done it, and I've still tried to honor this craft, um, and you're saying everyone can do it, and I understand that you are not you're not saying that you're saying we need a structure that cut a different a restructuring uh not necessarily that there cannot be specialized p- artists right people who specialize in a craft yeah totally you know so if you if you're like that was originally artist artisan if you uh kind of have a special skills i was i spent stupidly long lot of years i would say to to train myself to draw, you know, as uh, as really realistic because that was a system, and sometimes I'm using that, and most of the time not. So that's that's great, you know. It's just like it shouldn't make 
uh, you don't want a system in which nobody wants, in which uh, some somebody would say, okay, these people, because they know how to draw as as it's a photograph, now we'll get like much more resources and they will decide <laughs> what we sh- what kind of paintings we should watch or like, uh, you know, what, what would be in the museum. So you have your skills, you use your skills when um, when it's good occasion. I mean, the problem is this is you also mentioned this, that in a capitalist society, not everyone has the time and the, t- the issue of time within the society. That's the that's the real sticking point, because it's really only people who have means who have also have the time to, to train. Exactly. Very, very good point, because then it happens often that the people who have some means, some skills, they try to get paid for that skill. So then they will have time. And the other wouldn't. And then it's like, you know, one after another. And then suddenly you have a certain group of people who's like, okay, this is art. This is every what everybody wants to watch. And and it's like I was telling you a story about live journal. It's not so innocent. It's very quickly come from uh, uh, somebody who control the content production, like this uh, school student, yeah? And then he's uh, quickly rearranged this field in a way that content production become like an oppressive, political oppressive machine, you know? Well, it's an amazing case study. Somebody should write about that, yeah. Somebody, some sociologist should definitely write about the story of Life Journal. It's all on the open. There is no conspiracy. But I mean, it's. I think there's many, many stories like that on the internet. It, it has a tendency to go in that direction because it just feels like the kinds of people like the Russian oligarchs are simply going to find a way, you know, because they're most of them are on the sociopathic spectrum. But then the question is, well, how do you, what, I mean, how, what do you do? I mean, maybe just the awareness that you just shouldn't sell uh, your, <laughs> you shouldn't sell your platform, you know? Yeah. Oh, you should just, no, I should have, uh, like, that was a really good about specifically about live journal was a really good discussion uh, that was, quite clearly uh, explained and formulated. The problem is not this uh, student by himself. The problem in this case is an ideology of the platform. So you have to do something that is distributed. Like you cannot sell Mastodon because Mastodon is a network of servers who each of whom is originally uh, independent. You know, you can sell one server, but then thousands of others will still be there, you know, and they will connect to each other. And if you sell your server or start to put advertisement on your server or become like a small oligarch in your server, people may not refer to you. That's it, you know. So that's that's actually how how things should be done. Well, that's wonderful because that's a real real solution, practical solution to this particular problem. So, so the last question, I just wanted to ask this word communism. I feel like it only really today appeals to a certain kind of educated leftist elite in a way, you know, and I just wonder if, if it really is useful to use the term communism, you know, because people either like it, I think, for the wrong reason, or it just alienates them because they don't un- understand it, that actually communist regime was something different than communism per se, or certainly than art communism, which is its own thing. But that word communism, if you're talking about changing minds, if you're talking about uh, creating a community, I just wonder if it just isn't just too much of a burden. And so, so why why do you continue to use the term? Yeah, it's actually a very interesting question. There was lots of discussion about that. Should we drop it? Uh, because like Stalin really, or some other people really uh, poisoned the term. But uh it's it's a long discussion, but the short answer is uh, uh, no. Actually, we should try to save the word because it's not belongs to Stalin or to Soviet Union. It's actually belong to commune, like to Paris commune. That is, uh, you know, if you start to drop here and there, you very quickly will be moved uh, to the territory of the um, of the you know that you don't want to end up. So we are the one who is creating content, and we should uh, create it in a way that it will be resistible, you know, because revolution is a change of the political common sense. So we don't we don't want to attract people who on any condition. We want to kind of attract them on the condition that uh, that you know will really change something meaningful. And uh, communism, yeah, in this case it's really good to, to talk about how communism has nothing to do with the centralized capitalistic monopolism. Uh, repressive regimes that was in um, in uh, Soviet Union uh, 
after very quickly after revolution. Uh, and you, you can see it now with like Putin's speeches, how he's uh, um, very much neoliberal and uh, very much anti-communist, you know. So it's just no doubts uh, what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my, my point wasn't that, you know, communism, I understand the roots of the word, but more like practically speaking, you know, <laughs> is it a good, is it, it doesn't it alienate people that maybe could actually in the end be on your side? Because unfortunately, we live in such a distractible time that people can kind of get quickly alienated by something and you'll, you lose them, you know. Yeah, it's a very, very good question. So maybe we should discuss yeah. it next time, the strategy of how yeah. to create a big community. So because we ran out of time again, my conversation with Mika Dubrovsky ended on a bit of a cliffhanger. If you, like me, are a bit uncomfortable with the word communism and this idea of gathering people to make a revolution, that ending may have sounded a bit scary. So precisely because there are so many things I don't fully agree with or that I just feel aren't really clearly articulated in this conversation, I would like to read the essay Another Art World, the one Nika Dubrovsky wrote with David Graeber, on this podcast and comment on it as I go along. The reason I keep this podcast up is because I believe understanding the social structures around art, that is how it's made, who it's made by, who it's made for, is in fact integral to understanding how to live well in our world. Which actually, when you think about it, is the thing everyone, no matter their politics, is trying to figure out. Here's to being on the verge. <laughs>